Okay, everybody, it's, it's time for the bear pit. Let's roll. And I want to thank Lynn because Lynn and I were talking, while they're coming up, Lynn and I were talking about things we, uh, we like. And we both, we both like pecan pie. So, so Lynn sweetened me up by having some uh, pecan pie at my plate. So I've got to give really good answers now. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator for the Minister's Forum, Nigel Bellchamber. Wow, you're lined up already. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the 2018 AMO Minister's Forum. This is an opportunity for elected officials to ask their elected counterparts in the provincial cabinet, questions of general municipal interest. You note I said general municipal interest because there have been, as I understand it, yesterday, well, starting Sunday, yesterday and tomorrow and today, over 550 delegations. Those are opportunities for you to ask questions of specific local interest. So today it's an opportunity to pose questions of general mun municipal interest to the ministers. Now, there's a number of basic rules, and I think most of you are familiar with them. You only get a chance to ask one question. It's not a two-part or a three-part question, no multi-part questions. There will be no supplementaries. You can pose your question to one minister, and it's a specific, not to the entire panel. It may be that a, the minister to whom you pose it needs to refer it to one of his or her colleagues on the panel because of uh, some specificity in terms of the issue, but uh, one minister only. In posing your question, you need to identify yourself, the municipality you're from, the position you occupy at the municipality. That's very helpful to the, to the ministers. In posing your question, you have about 30 seconds. I have a timer here. It tells me what the elapsed time is. That gives you about 10 seconds to make an introductory preamble and up to 20 to pose your question. This is, an isn't, is not an opportunity uh, to make a speech. Now the question is, well, so what? What if, I, what if I bend the rules at the microphone? Well, Brian, Marty, and his crew back there know that this means cut off the mic. It's happened before. So not worried about, not afraid to do it. There will be an opportunity within an hour we have for about 20 questions. So there's six microphones and I see more than 20 people, quite frankly. To the extent that you can be brief, it will serve your other colleagues very well. And I've also asked the ministers in the pre-briefing if they would attempt to be equally brief. They know that the most popular answer is yes, that's pretty brief. But, <laughs> Over the years, the second most popular answer has been no, because it too is brief and it's clear. I always reserve the right to add new rules should the need arise, and I'm going to do that this time again. And I was posed one specific question unique to today, and uh, I'll, I'll single him out. He's been a, he's been a great uh, municipal leader, Mayor Dave Canfield from Kenora said, so I'm not returning, I'm not running again, and uh, would you cut me some slack? And I said, no, Dave, doesn't work, no dispensation. I would like to add my thanks to all of you who are not running again for your leadership and your commitment over the years, but as I just said, it doesn't get your break on the rules. So, with that, I'm going to introduce the ministers, and I'm gonna start from my left. If you're wondering about the Seating preference, you've probably figured it out already from the tent cards, with the exception of, of Minister Clark, they're in alphabetical order. I'm gonna start on the far left, and please, hold any applause. 
uh, just in the interests of time. So on my far left, Jeff Urich, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. John Yakubuski, Minister of Transportation. Jim Wilson, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Michael Tobolo, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Lisa Thompson, Minister of Education. Todd Smith, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. And beside him, Laurie Scott, Minister of Labor. Next is Greg Rickford, Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Indigenous Affairs. Next comes Rod Phillips, Minister of Environment, Conservation, and Parks. And on my immediate left, Carolyn Neroni, who is the Attorney General. Starting on my far right, Raymond Cho, Minister with Responsibility for Seniors and Accessibility. Christine Elliott, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Next is Victor Fidelli, Minister of Finance, followed by Mary Lee Fullerton, training colleges and universities. Following that is my longtime friend, I have to say that, Ernie and I first got involved in municipal government and at AMO uh, quite a few years ago. Ernie, we won't tell him the number of years, will we? Ernie Hardeman, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Next is Sylvia Jones, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Beside her is Lisa McLeod, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And next is Monty McNaughton, Minister of Infrastructure, the delegation count winner, I understand. And finally, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, as you heard from Steve Clark. So I'm going to start with microphone number three. So microphone number three, your name, municipality, position, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, it's Michael Donahue. I am uh, mayor of Admaston Bromley Township in the uh, beautiful Ottawa Valley. Uh, I first wish to express my congratulations on a resounding electoral victory in the province of Ontario. Uh, to all of the ministers assembled, thank you very much. My question is for uh, the Honourable Caroline Mulroney, the Attorney General. Uh, bienvenue, welcome home, uh, back to your childhood home. Um, Reasonable limits on joint and several liability are needed so municipal, municipalities can afford to allow activities like road hockey and tobogganing. This was written for Roma, I didn't get to the microphone. Almost all other provinces have, resolu have solutions in place to make sure municipalities are not used as deep pocket defendants in lawsuits and are held accountable in proportion to their actions. The perennial question, hopefully to end with this session, will the provincial government agree to put fair and reasonable limits on municipal liability? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question, and uh, thank you for the welcome. Merci beaucoup. C'est un plaisir d'être de retour à Ottawa, bien sûr. Um, uh, this, I know, has been an issue of concern at AMO for a very long time. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet with some delegations from Mississauga and from Limerick, who raised it with me. And so we had a chance to discuss it. And I did advise them, uh, which I'm happy to report, that uh, we're looking at it uh, very closely. We understand how it important it is for municipalities. Uh, and so we are we're looking at it. We've been briefed on it and look forward to uh, working closely with municipalities to help address their, your concerns. Thank you. Microphone number two, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Tony Van Bynen. I'm the Mayor Emeritus of the town of Newmarket. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Ontario needs to fix interest arbitration to make sure that police and firefighters get fair wage increases that the taxpayers can afford. If the government is expecting municipalities to manage salary increases within our own funding sources, we need legislative changes to move closer to recognizing our capacity to pay. We're not asking to establish an outcome, but only that it must be fully considered by the arbitrator to use as one criteria amongst many. So are you willing to commit to adding this lens to the existing criteria list? Thank you. Minister Scott? Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I heard about this uh, issue in almost every meeting that I had over the last couple of days. And it's a long-standing issue with our communities. Um, 
I appreciate the municipalities that actually brought forward uh, some suggestions um, for some changes that could be looked at. So I have directed uh, my ministry staff to look into uh, the issue and the suggestions that were brought forward so that we uh, can look at it and get back to you, for sure. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number one, please. Hi, my name is Mary Lloyd. I'm a counselor with Ward 5 in Wellington County. My ward is located on the banks of the Canadian Heritage Grand River that begins at the base of the Bruce Peninsula and travels through Dufferin, Wellington, Waterloo, Brant, Six Nations, and Halderman and empties in Lake Erie. Currently, the province of Ontario is under a moratorium on the issuance of commercial water taking permits that is set to expire in January 19. Currently, scientific studies are underway in the former ministries of environment, climate change, and the natural resources. And this is to do with source water taking and the usage and needs. Today, municipalities do not have a priority on these licenses to take water. Commercial licenses are pending upon the issuance of this end of moratorium. And the question is, will the ministry please consider making municipalities needs first and put the new licenses, which only pay $503.71 per million liters, on hold until full scientific research reviews can be completed, which may take up until 2023. Minister? No, they turned them on back there, so they should be live as soon as they know what's your question. Sorry. Minister Phillips? Great. Thank you for the question. It was uh, certainly a topic of conversation. We're looking at all, um, all aspects of water, what we put into water, uh, how we take water, um, priorities for, for whom can take water. Uh, this was something that was, was raised uh, very directly by at least four of the delegations that we talked to. So, so you, can, you can expect uh, to, to hear from us on all of those topics and certainly understand the, um, the priority. I think uh, municipalities today are needing to think and are thinking into the future uh, in terms of what needs they may have for their own, for their own uh, economic development as well as for, for rapidly growing residential populations, particularly in areas like yourself. So, so that is a, it's a priority from our perspective and it was something that uh, I gained a lot of insight from, from the groups who saw me. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Microphone number four, please. Hi, I'm Bert Liverance from the Township of the Archipelago. It's the largest freshwater archipelago in the world on Georgian Bay. My question is for Minister Clark. There is an Ontario-wide issue that affects many municipalities, including Leeds, many ministries, including the MNR, MOT, MOE, and Ag and Food. The issue is Phragmites. It's an aggressive, invasive species. Would you please consider taking this issue as the lead, taking this on as the lead ministry? We would be happy, as I mentioned, in several delegations to host uh, any interested parties who would like to participate. Okay. Minister Clark? Yeah, I'm going to defer to uh, the Minister of Environment, uh, Conservation of Parks. Okay. I'm, I'm pleased to have the chance to, to talk about this. This, again, was something that was raised. Phragmites is a, there, there are both uh, elements of control that, um, again, we will, uh, we are looking into, but, but uh, tools that uh, have been used on a, on a pilot basis that, that I think can help a great deal and that, again, I heard about as well as uh, the prioritization of it. I agree with you, uh, by the way, it is a, it is a multi-ministry um, multi -ministry concern um, because it overlaps, so I'll, I'll be happy to work with my ministerial colleagues on it, but, uh, but we understand both the, the, the requirements in terms of, of the kind of tools, including the chemical tools that, that have been proven to work in other areas, and also the, uh, the need to work work collectively on this. It's a, it's a serious threat to our, uh, to our environment and our waterfront. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number five, please. Mayor David Canfield, City of Kenora. First off, I want to congratulate all of you up there. Uh, and uh, this uh, question is going to go to the Minister of Finance, but it's actually going to go to the, to the whole cabinet. And I'm going to have to talk fast, so listen up and listen fast. For the last 25, 30 years, the upper levels of government have downloaded their debt problems to municipalities. Now, we see a ray of hope with the way you're talking, but I'm not talking about the ray days, and I'm not talking about the transfer downloads back in the early 90s. I'm not talking about all the 4,000 kilometers of highways and the thousands of bridges that were downloaded in the late 1997 and on. And I'm not talking about in the 2000s, the supposed upload that was sometimes good, sometimes bad. 
And I'm also not talking about some things you've already heard about, about the bad rules and standards and regulations that have been brought into this province over the last 25, 30 years, like Bill 148, which is killing us. And your question, the New Mr. fire Mayor. standards, failures to address interest arbitration, joint and separate liability, and the minimum maintenance standard for sidewalks. Yeah. The question, ministers, cabinet, will you commit to no more downloads to the municipalities of Ontario that are already blessed with the highest municipal property taxes in Canada? Okay. <laughs> Mayor Canfield, I think you have a, have a career ahead of you as a radio announcer. <laughs> Minister Fideli. Well, thank you very much. It sounded like an auction, Dave. I love it. It's uh, I have uh, one word for you, uh, Dave, and that's relief. That's the message that we heard our Premier Doug Ford and our entire uh, uh, scope of candidates tell, uh, talk to the people of Ontario over this last election period. And I think you've seen it already by cancelling cap and trade. We put $260 back in the pockets of families. Uh, 4.3 cents will come off the price of gas. We plan on reducing gas. You'll, you'll see my theme uh, very quickly, uh, Mayor Canfield. Uh, 12% reduction coming in the uh, off of uh, hydro rates, uh, reduction of corporate income tax from 11.5 to 10.5%, reduction of small business tax rate by 8.75%, and the list quite literally goes on and on. I think you get the message. We need relief for families, relief for municipalities, relief for businesses. It's one word, Dave, and that's relief. Is, relief is on its way. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number six, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robin Jones. I'm the mayor of the village of Westport and the chair of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Minister Rickford. Minister, municipal governments are interested in continuing our relationships with their First Nations and Métis neighbours. A challenge we face in doing this is the lack of clarity around the Crown's duty to consult. This confusion is leading to tensions on the ground and it limits our abilities to maintain these meaningful relationships. Municipal governments generally do not have the knowledge, capacity or resources to fulfill the Crown's constitutional obligations. We are being told by Ontario line ministries to consult with First Nations when we are seeking a provincial approval to manage a municipal responsibility but without any clarity on the scope of the treaty or Aboriginal right or assertion that we are to consult on. And your question, it, please. The question is, what will your government do to increase clarity around the Crown's duty to consult to assist municipalities and the Indigenous people that we live beside? Thank you. Minister Rickford. Well, thank you for the question. And obviously, uh, I'd like to frame this far more as an opportunity than an issue uh, in my previous uh, capacities. Uh, I've dealt extensively not only working in indi Indigenous communities in the far north but in and around towns and cities uh, and I understand uh, the opportunity. We are redoubling our efforts currently to solidify uh, consultation capacity with Indigenous communities uh, and we will frame that in the context of, for example, in uh, resource revenue sharing and the likes, um, making sure that uh, municipalities uh, are very much at the table and that the duty to consult in its scope is understood in the context of the opportunity, whether it's uh, a, a, an opportunity around land uh, or, or its resources. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number three, please. Thank you, Thank you Nigel. And again, congratulations to all. Um, my question is to uh, the Honourable Christine Elliott in your role as Deputy Premier. Uh, I hope you don't take this that um, your opening remarks when ignored, uh, Minister Clark, uh, but they're, the red tape that we're facing is, is uh, far and away one of the biggest challenges we have in our lower tiers. I'm sorry, I'm Jennifer Murphy. I'm the mayor of Bonashir Valley and the, and the warden of the county of Renfrew, the most beautiful place on earth. Right, right Yak? <laughs> right. I, I apologize for that. You're using up valuable. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we know that there are at least 280 pieces of legislation affecting municipal governments in Ontario. It requires reporting and regulations. Um, I think working together, we can identify and reduce the burden on our lower tiers and our upper tiers. But how we do this is critically important. Um, so. 
I think what we're looking for is just a commitment um, that you will work with AMO and our municipalities uh, to figure out how to do this necessary streamline that will certainly uh, let us get back to our local responsibilities. Well, thank you very much for your question, Mayor Murphy, but I am going to defer to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It is his responsibility as far as that ministry is concerned. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Minister Elliott, and thanks, uh, uh, Warden, for that question. You know, as I said in my speech, it's something that uh, is going to be driven from uh, from my ministry, and already uh, my deputy, uh, Laurie LeBlanc, has already engaged uh, some other deputies. So we're 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 hitting the ground running. This is something we're very um, we're very um, a big priority for us. It was one of the very first things that, uh, other than the 40 million for marijuana. Uh, that Lynn mentioned to me on the very first phone call, and I think it was one of the f first four things that Pat Benini said to me on my call to her. So we're serious. We've listened to you over and over again about unnecessary uh, bureaucracy that we're causing uh, multiple ministry. Uh, we're committed to fixing it, and my ministry is committed to being the, uh, the quarterback of the initiative. Microphone number two, please. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Mason Ainsworth. I'm a councillor from the city of Aurelia, as well as a new uh, AMO board member. So thank you so much for joining us here. It really means a lot to me uh, to see our new ministers here. Uh, my question, I'm not quite too sure, so I'm going to give it to uh, the new attorney general. And uh, so recently, AMO has changed directions from uh, disaster relief uh, to youth engagement. We've seen issues with you know, the lack of youth voting, the lack of education in our schools in regards to local uh, government as well as provincial and federal government and getting folks engaged not only you know in the work system working as a staff uh, but also running as candidates so I'm just curious what you folks are looking towards uh, as a solution for that in the future or maybe some steps uh, to get youth more engaged uh, I'll defer the question refer the question to uh, my seatmate in the legislature Minister McLeod Minister McLeod no, oh, it's okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I happen to be Minister of Children and Youth for the province of Ontario, uh, in addition to community and social services, women, um, basic, uh, sorry, the uh, poverty reduction strategy, and citizenship and immigration. So one of the things that we want to do is build a, a process uh, with our municipalities, but certainly with our education system, with the Minister of Education, um, to work with youth at risk and youth in our justice system and youth and in, in, in our uh, care facilities across Ontario. Um, that work is being done right now. We have a, a singular focus on making sure that there are opportunities for those youth. Um, some, in some of the delegations, many of these questions have, have been spoken about, uh, but we're looking really at uh, bringing forward a much more of a mentorship mold than has been done in previous years, but there's a lot of exciting work that's being done, and I'll be working with the ministers of uh, community safety as well as the attorney general in the next phase of our guns and gangs. Um, rollout, uh, predominantly for children who are at risk and children who are in the justice system. So I'm happy to work with you further on that. And we're all ears to listen to new ideas that you may have in your communities. Uh, we don't believe in a one size fits all. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number one, please. Thank you. My name's Kathy Downer. I'm a city councillor in the city of Guelph, which I thought was the most beautiful place in Ontario. Clearly, <laughs> many of us will make that claim, I'm sure. So my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark. Uh, we know that the OMB was expensive, drawn out, and shifted planning decisions from local people to a legal process. Will this government commit to keeping the local planning appeals tribunal in place for at least a few years to evaluate if this process better respects local decisions? Minister Clark. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for the question. I'll try to be short because uh, we, we came to this conference wanting to hear from our municipal partners about our, our planning system, and you're not the first person this hour who has recommended that we, we let things go and, and, and see how the new system works. So I'm very mindful that that's been a common uh, suggestion to our government since I literally walked in the door. It's like every hour on the hour I've had this uh, suggestion uh, by municipalities. So that's, that's where my head is right now. Thank you. Microphone number four, please. Thank you, Nigel, and I want to congratulate the new government and the cabinet. Congratulations, everyone. My name is Alan Thompson. I'm the mayor of Caledon. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Laurie Scott, concerning double hatters. 
Will the province commit to helping us stop the union harassment of volunteer fighter fighters who want to serve in the community for their, on their own time? And by providing legislative protection for our double hatters like other North American jurisdictions. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I certainly heard that through many delegations, and I um, understand the particular urgency in your community. Uh, representing a rural constituency, I know the file quite intimately. Uh, I have um, promised that I would look uh, into the issue, listen to all the sides, and uh, I will uh, certainly be coming back with uh, some answers for you, but we're going to look into it for sure. And we heard it loud and clear. Thank you. Microphone number five, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Veronica Farrell. I'm from Timmins, Ontario, and a counselor. I'm also on the board of directors for community living in Timmins. I have a daughter who is also on disability. Um, our clients received a letter in the spring that they were having a 3% increase on their checks. This will be for Mr. Fideli. Okay. Um, now they find out they're going to be decreased to 1.5%. They got a decrease. My, my question, I think, is why is it more important to have a dollar beer than to have food on the table for our dis disabled people? Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll cover the first part and perhaps turn you over to uh, Minister McLeod. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, the comment about uh, the uh, reduction, uh, I'm sure you'll hear from Minister McLeod that, that the increase will be 1.5% and she'll give more details on that in a moment. Um, but the buck of beer is uh, a promise that was made over the election. It took a very short time to implement. It costs the government nothing. It's not a, it doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. It's a program that lowers the uh, uh, floor on the sale price of beer if the beer uh, sellers want to do that. It's not a government uh, role uh, in terms of uh, uh, any, ta any, uh, any cost to the government whatsoever. It's just merely lowering the price uh, allowed that they're allowed to sell at. And I'll ask uh, Minister McLeod to answer the part about the uh, social services side. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Minister Fidelli. Thanks very much for your question. I appreciate the opportunity to have that discussion with you. And I do hope to, to visit your community soon and hopefully uh, see the community living. Uh, what we announced um, uh, just under a month ago was we were going to hit the pause button on the previous Liberal administration's plan for uh, social assistance, but also a poverty reduction. Um, when my ministry was repatriated, we found that there was a patchwork of programs that were um, it, it, underway um, that really weren't communicating with one another. If you can believe it, basic income wasn't speaking to social assistance. Um, the ODSP and, and Ontario Works were fragmented, and, and, uh, and that happened as well with the uh, Ministry of um, Poverty Reduction. It was a standalone. So what we had said was we were going to hit the pause button, and during that pause period, uh, we were going to come back in 100 days on November the 8th uh, with a sustainable plan that integrates the entire ministry. Uh, that work is being done. It started immediately. And as a result, we wanted on compassionate grounds to increase the rates by 1.5% across the board uh, in social assistance, Ontario Works and ODSP, as we come forward with a plan that we believe is more sustainable that will get those who can be employed uh, back into work and those who need a little bit more support that we can provide that. Um, I had a series of delegations over the past three days working with many communities, including uh, with yours, on ideas on how we can better serve uh, Ontario's residents, whether they're on Ontario Works or Ontario Disability supports but one of the key things is we have to move away from um, my staff and your staff spending 90% of their time on administration so they can actually help the people that they need to help the most so we want to make sure that we come forward with a compassionate plan one that uh, one that is sustainable and one that gets those who can get into the workforce back on track and those who need additional supports that we provide that with them and I look forward to having a greater conversation with you at that time thank you Microphone number six, please. Thank you. Uh, John Abel, Town of Aurora, Deputy Mayor, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Okay. All across the province, Ontarians are struggling with the affordability of housing both in tight rental conditions and overheated real estate markets. There are opportunities to leverage uh, 
federal investments through the National Housing Strategy and for AMO and municipal governments to work with your ministry and the private sector to build more affordable housing supply. The question, what is your government's plan to work with the municipal governments to address the housing affordability situation? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and it's one that deserves applause. Um, you know, our government supply is key uh, for affordable housing. Uh, we're certainly pleased with the renewed commitment from the federal government on the housing file. Uh, I've said in our delegations that I believe that uh, part of what I've been hearing are a number of great suggestions from uh, municipalities that I, we need to deliver on behalf of both our levels of government to the federal uh, government as we move forward. I think uh, there's a number of ways that we can get uh, supply uh, you know, out there faster, and I think part of it is streamlining some of the, uh, the development issues that, uh, that take place. It's something that, uh, that my ministry is doing. Obviously, we've got a municipal election on October 22nd. We've already convened a, a working group with, uh, with my staff and municipal staff. We've written them recently. Uh, about that, and we're going to continue to talk to them while you're out knocking on doors and and uh, trying to get reelected to have that conversation. So after October 22nd, we can really hit the ground running, try to get some development streamlined, but at the same time communicate what your wants and needs are to the federal level. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number three, please. Tonight, thank you very much, Nigel. Joanne Vander Hayden, Mayor Strathroy Caradoc. One thing I'm really excited about: you're not looking at binders; you're listening. So I'm appreciating that your answers are not preconceived. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Rural hospitals are a tremendous asset and serve a critical role in our communities. Current, current funding formula is volume-based, as you know, and awards larger geographic areas that are growing while not recognizing structural issues that are inherent in me medium-sized hospitals. Adequate funding and stable working capital are immediately needed to safeguard local frontline health care services, local employment, and capacity throughout the system. This question goes to the Honorable Christine Elliott. Could you please revisit the funding formula so our hospitals in small urban and rural Ontario can continue their role serving our residents? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, the short answer to this is yes, we are taking a look at the funding formula. I have heard from a number of delegations today indicating that there seems to be a structural problem with funding for medium-sized hospitals, and I certainly will undertake to you and other municipalities that we are taking a look at it to see what we can do. Thank you. Microphone number two, please. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Dennis Doyle, I'm the Mayor of Frontenac Islands, also Chair of the Kingston Frontenac Lennox and Addington Public Health Unit. And uh, M Minister Elliott, we believe that a gram of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. Uh, during the uh, past 10, or during the 10 years between 2004 to 2013, 22% of Ontario healthcare cost was spent as a result of four unhealthy behaviors poor eating habits, physical inactivity, tobacco, and alcohol abuse. Uh, there is a good return on uh, investment on investing in programs to improve the health of the population of Ontario, which will save a lot of that $9 billion spent on these uh, four activities per year. Minister, will you look at a public health initiative uh, that uh, have a high return on investment to keep people out of hospitals, ambulances, doctor's office, and other health care workers. Thank you, Mayor Doyle. Minister? Well, thank you very much for the question, and I do agree with you. I think what we always want to do is to um, put a greater emphasis on uh, wellness, people preventing people from getting ill to be healthier. I think that requires um, activity across a number of ministries, not just the health ministry. Certainly it is important for people to eat properly, to get exercise, not drink too much, not smoke. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do because we find that even people with chronic conditions like diabetes with a proper regimen can not be cured, but can their, their symptoms can be lessened significantly, fewer hospitalizations, a greater quality of life, and uh, a healthier population generally. So I think we all need to work together. I look forward to working with public health and a number of other organizations to get us there. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number one, please. Thank you. Diane Freeman, City of Waterloo. My friends, municipalities have always been for the people. We respect citizens' dollars and consistently are forced to do more with much, much less. 
One avenue to do this is to invest in complete streets and active transportation corridors. These corridors connect citizens to higher order transit and important local destinations. Active transportation corridors support children, older adults, and individuals using accessibility devices. Recently, this government withdrew critical funding for this infrastructure. Minister Yakubuchi, when will it be reinstated? Minister Yakubuchi. Well, thank you very much uh, for the question. Yeah, and uh, though that uh, program was funded by the cap and trade revenue, which we have canceled that cap and trade program, which uh, as well as the uh, funding, it takes away the revenue. Having said that, we're reviewing every, we're doing a line by line assessment of the finances of the province of Ontario. And every program is under review. Uh, the, the act of uh, transportation was part of that cap and trade, and it's part of the review. So as we complete the review, we'll be assessing all of, all of our abilities to deliver programs that are important to the people of Ontario, and we are here to serve the people, and we will take that into due consideration when, the, when those decisions are made. But we're working with Treasury Board and Finance uh, to determine just what the financial condition of the province is, and when we have a better handle on that, we'll be better able to answer that question. But thank you very much for posing it. We do know it is important. Thank you. Thank you, Minister uh, Yakubuski. My apologies for mispronouncing your name. Microphone number four, please. Thank you, Nigel. <clears throat> I would like to congratulate uh, the forum and the new ministers. It's uh, nice to see that uh, we're hearing, we're open for business in Ontario. That's a great, great uh, moment for us. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and uh, it's relating to the uh, funding for forestry. Uh, as you know, in Northern Ontario, sorry, I should have said, I am also the mayor of Greenstone in Northern Ontario uh, on Highway 11. So uh, we depend on funding and, and maintenance of these roads for industry, tourism, re and uh, uh, recreation, emergencies. Uh, what kind of funding and support can we count on from the government of Ontario for Northern Ontario on, on roads and uh, for moving forward? Okay. Thanks Minister. very much uh, okay. for that question. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have committed to the uh, $54 uh, billion, dollars, uh, or $54 million, excuse me, that uh, <laughs> I just, I just spoke to, gave uh, poor Vic a heart attack there. $54 million that was budgeted last year for forestry roads. We understand the importance uh, of uh, the forestry roads, not only for the forestry industry, but as you said, it's not only for road safety, uh, when the fires that are going on in Northern Ontario, they use those access roads, the tourism, uh, people's recreational enjoyment. We, we get that and we want to build on, on a solution that's good for the forestry industry and, and Northern Ontario as a whole. We're committed to that $54 million this year and we're committed to working with the industry uh, to look forward to continued funding to how we build and develop the economy in Northern Ontario and forestry is going to play a key role in that. Thank you very much. And before I go into microphone number five, I just want to remind everyone your name, your municipality, your position and the minister to whom you wish to address your question. I know you're all very keen on your questions, but uh, it makes it easier for everybody involved if you can remember your name, your municipality, your position, and the minister to whom you wish to address your question. Microphone number five, please. Hello, I'm Kelly Elliott. I am a councillor in the municipality of Thames Centre. My question goes to the Minister of Transportation. Perfect. The high-speed rail uh, proposed um, route has detrimental impacts to the rural communities that it travels through, as well as the surrounding areas. Will you commit to including alternatives to the current high-speed rail proposal in the environmental assessment, as well as consulting with rural municipalities and agricultural stakeholders? Okay. Minister. Well, thank you very much uh, for the question, and we had a chance to uh, meet earlier this uh, week on Sunday to uh, talk about that very issue. Uh, we are committed to the assessment and the analyzing uh, the potential of high-speed rail. It's something that uh, we would be, uh, I think, wrong not to follow through to do the study. Uh, but we also have found that there are differing views on what kind of uh, what services are needed uh, through some of the areas, particularly some of the, the rural areas. And we are certainly cognizant of the uh, concerns of, of those communities, and we articulated that uh, in our meetings uh, with those communities on the weekend. And we will be certainly taking all of those into consideration. 
uh, there's no decision has been made, and, there ha and the case will have to be made that there is a demand for it and it can be successful. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but before that decision is made, I can assure you that the views of those communities affected will be taken into due consideration, and thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number six, please. Thank you very much, Nigel. I'm Graydon Smith, the mayor of the town of Bracebridge, uh, OSIM chair, and a proud AMO board member. And my question is for Minister Elliott. And first of all, I'd say I support Mayor Vander Hayden's comments 1,000%, Minister. And we talked about that today, about the problem with medium-sized hospitals. And the hospital on Ann Street in Bracebridge cannot compete with a hospital on University Avenue with the same funding formula. But there's a longer term issue with hospitals in terms of capital builds and the amount that communities are expected to provide uh, under the 10% share program um, that the province currently expects. In our case, it's more like 24%, which is over $120 million in Muskoka that we would have to come up with as a community share. And the reality is that means taxation. That means going to our taxpayers and taking money that we could otherwise be using for activities that were actually mandated to do and infrastructure that we know we need to build and repair. Uh, but instead, we have to divert it towards the health care system. So, Graydon, we need to talk, turn this so, into a general application absolutely. question, if you could. Well, it is a general application question because communities throughout Ontario will face exactly the same thing when they have a major community build. So I'm asking you, Minister, uh, will you commit to capping that community share at 10 percent or eliminating it altogether so communities can get on with the regular business that they have to do instead of funding the health care system? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. We did have a chance to discuss some of this briefly before, but I think one of the most important things that I heard from a number of delegates today was to understand where they are and what's happening with their capital requests. Uh, in some cases, there have been requests that have been granted but then taken away, in some cases several times, and that really um, it destroys the morale in a community where people have raised money in good faith, where they, in some cases, are asking for their donations back Nobody wants to see that. So I think what you need to see is that openness and transparency uh, from the Ministry of Health and all of the other ministries, actually, so that communities know where they stand. That can help with community building. I'd like to say nobody has to raise any money, but we're not in that situation in Ontario right now. But I can promise you that we will be open and transparent and to let you know where you are, what you need, and how you can move forward with your projects. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number three, please. Hi, I'm Marcus Ryan, a councillor in the Township of Zora, doing our part in Oxford County. My question is for the Minister of Education. With a continued moratorium on school closures, is it the Minister's intention to restart a review of the Pupil Accommodation Review Guideline or to continue the work and complete the implementation of the Pupil Accommodation Review Guideline that was released in April? Thank you, Minister Thompson. Thank you very much for that question, and it was a pleasure to meet with you earlier today. And what we want to do is make sure that we utilize the resources and the efforts that have been made to date and work with our ministry officials to make sure that we get it right. And uh, as I mentioned to you uh, during our meeting, I want to throw the cookie cutter out because representing a rural riding, I know what applies in an urban setting sometimes doesn't fit in small town rural Ontario. And so with that, we are going to work with our ministry officials, as I mentioned, and make sure that when we move forward, we're going to be moving forward in a thoughtful manner that reflects on where, where we have gotten to date and where we need to go forward to address the issues as they come forward to us. And again, I can't stress enough, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we want to be working with you in terms of the school alliance and municipalities because we recognize the importance that schools play in the overall economic consideration of our municipalities. So thanks very much for that question. Thank you. Microphone number two, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Vicki Leakey, Councillor for the Township of Leeds, Thousand Islands. This will be a question for Minister Clark, uh, Ministry of Affairs and Housing. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm going to tackle this on affordable housing where ha would the ministries consider I'm, I'm going to age myself. There was a program called the Ontario Home Renewal Program. Okay. There are many, many residents that need septic systems, new roofs. Now that the rebate on energy efficient um, renovations is gone, 
these, these are not like low, low income, but they need help to stay in their home. And I know it's not a new build, so it may not be as pretty a picture, but is there any opportunity for bringing these programs back that will allow people to do costly repairs in their home with some grant and some loan capacity? Thank you very much. Minister? Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Vicky, for the question. And uh, certainly during the campaign, we talked about reducing the burden for taxpayers. One of the things that was very mindful for homeowners was our commitment to reduce hydro bills by 12% because we heard quite clearly from people that they wanted a break. They wanted to be able to have some reduction so that they could stay in their homes. You know, I, I've had a lot of suggestions of, uh, on the housing side. Uh, mostly on the public housing side on, on with our you know suggestions for our local service managers and our indigenous program administrators you know I mentioned the federal government and you know I'm not sure um, you know whether that could be part of the discussion uh, although I know previous uh, federal governments have looked at, at that I remember Minister uh, Flaherty with the with the program that you know I think did a number of uh, improvements certainly you know, I, I used the the program the federal program when it was available on on my home uh, and I know many others in my neighborhood did. So, you know, if you've got some suggestions, uh, again, it, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to entertain them, more than happy to uh, discuss them at the federal level as well. So shoot them over and we'll have a discussion with our, with our colleagues. Thank you very much. Minister, microphone number one, please. Hello, my name is Julia Rowe. I'm a counselor with the municipality of Wawa. My question will be for the Honorable Lisa Thompson. We have been talking about the fact that youth engagement is a focus of AMO, and we also have another issue um, pressing with the new cannabis le legislation. And in that, the statement has been that education of the youth will fall to um, the municipalities to work with the schools. What will you be doing to support that process? Thank you. Minister Thompson? Thank you very much for that question. And uh, it's an opportunity for me to talk about the consultation that will be kicking off this fall. And I'm sincere when I say I want to hear from everyone in Ontario because there, it's going to be a comprehensive consultation that actually touches on, on cannabis. And we need to hear from youth and our communities in terms of how to go forward and make sure that our young people understand in terms of um, substance abuse and the long-term effects of it. We need to be taking a look at that, and our ministry officials actually have uh, embarked on a, a little project I've asked them to, to do in terms of how we can ensure that as cannabis becomes legal on October 17th under our federal government, that we have every support in place to ensure that our young people are educated and prepared to, to move forward in a community that now sees cannabis being legalized. And we all have to work together on this, for sure. Thank you, Mr. Microphone number four, please. I'm Jennifer Miltenberg. I'm a counselor in Asheville and Colburn, Wawanosh, which is southwestern Ontario, right on Lake Huron. If you want to know exactly, ask Nigel. I'm his counselor. Uh, this question is for the Minister of Infrastructure, although I also believe it's for the Minister of Health because it's about community health or community hub building. And there's a lot of data especially being shared by CBC that, for example, social isolation is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it does have long-term health effects to be socially isolated. It is under the division of community hubs, is under uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure because it builds infrastructure. It builds bridges between ministries. It builds roadmaps for people trying to do it. And from their own website, it supports projects that strengthen our communities and economy. So the question is actually very simple. I'm aware that every single thing is being looked at line by line financially, but Minister of Infrastructure, what is your commitment to the Community Hubs Division that was instigated by the previous government, and are you willing to work with the Ministry of Health because it is a health issue as well? Okay. Thanks for the plug, Jennifer, and congratulations on being acclaimed. Minister McNaughton. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for the question. Um, I thought I was going to get out of this with, uh, without having any questions. Uh, I thought maybe I met with everybody during the, uh, the delegations. Um, look, I have to be crystal clear that I actually like uh, the idea of, of hubs. I think there's, uh, there's value to them, uh, economic value, value from a, a social perspective. 
Um, we are, as you said, doing a line-by-line -line, uh, review right across uh, government. And uh, in the fall, we will be uh, laying out uh, clearly the federal provincial uh, infrastructure uh, program uh, for municipalities uh, in Ontario between the federal, provincial, and municipal uh, funding partnership. It'll be uh, $30 billion over the next uh, 10 years. And uh, I think there'll be an element in there uh, for uh, possible funding for uh, that type of concept. And I look forward to working with all municipalities uh, on that in the time ahead. Thank you very much. Microphone number five, please. Thank you. Nicole Fortilevac, municipality councillor uh, in the municipality of Moonbeam, Northern Ontario. Um, my question is directed to uh, uh, Minister uh, Elliott. Um, it has been proven that um, francophones and um, indigenous people uh, have uh, don't have uh, health uh, are not as healthy as the rest of the population, and uh, I am wondering. Um, what is your plan to ensure that uh, francophones and indigenous people receive um, the services they deserve? Thank you very much for the question. It is a really important one, one that I uh, worked on my, during my previous tenure at Queen's Park and one I worked on during my time as patient ombudsman as well. I concentrate on uh, francophone populations at first because I understood that people were not able to receive services in their first language and that becomes particularly important with respect to seniors care as well as for mental health and addiction counseling where it's really important to have that effective, meaningful communication. So we need to make sure that we concentrate our efforts to make sure that everyone in Ontario has access to high quality health services. So I think we need to work with uh, francophone populations and the réseau du service de santé en français to make sure that we can make sure that the services are distributed appropriately across the province. As far as services for um, Indigenous people, there is no question that the services are not of the same standard in many cases, particularly in uh, northern uh, fly-in communities, for example, where there is a, uh, a bit of a, a, a divide between federal and provincial responsibilities. It's the federal government that is responsible for the, uh, for the nursing stations, but of course they are our ambulance services and the hospital services are provincially run. So I think that we need to um, really work on our relationship with the federal government to make sure that uh, there is no gap in those services and to make sure that the nursing stations are appropriately served with the um, services and requirements that they need. You may have heard of a five-year-old child who died from strep throat in one of the uh, northern communities because they didn't have basic antibiotics. That shouldn't be happening in Ontario, and that's something that I intend to turn my attention to. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number six, please. Well, thank you, Nigel. Uh, Rick Maloney, uh, Councillor and Deputy Mayor for the town of Bracebridge, found in the heart of Muskoka, and also uh, the only uh, AMO member municipality that can boast that they have Santa Claus as a seasonal part-time resident. In that, uh, keeping with that, uh, uh, Santa Claus and the spirit of giving, uh, my question is to, uh, is to uh, the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, Minister McNaughton. Minister, municipal governments offer services that Ontarians depend on to make their lives better every day. To make sure we can continue to deliver these services, we need to know how the government will work with us on infrastructure funding. Can you tell us how you plan to support local infrastructure and when you'll when will our communities be able to access federal infrastructure funding under phase two of investing in, Ontario, in Canada plan? Great. Thank you uh, very much. Yes, it's, it's worth a clap. Um, I, obviously, this has been um, a, a very uh, important topic of a discussion uh, the last couple of days. Um, it is uh, priority number one uh, for me as, as Minister of Infrastructure. Our, our Premier has been clear that we are going to invest um, you know, in transit, roads, bridges, and uh, broadband and natural gas uh, across the province. And uh, uh, at some point uh, in the fall, we will be uh, releasing the details of the federal provincial uh, infrastructure uh, program. There'll be uh, four streams, the, the transit stream, uh, the green stream, which is water, wastewater, um, uh, and, and some others. There'll be the uh, community and recreation uh, portion. And then uh, lastly, there'll be uh, rural and northern 
uh, uh, chunk of money uh, for uh, those projects. So we uh, listened to municipalities the last couple of days to ask which uh, stream would be their priority uh, to release uh, first because as all municipalities know, we can't do all four streams at once. It would uh, be overwhelming for municipalities and for us uh, as a province. Um, but I will be uh, continuing to uh, work with municipalities to find out what their priorities are. And uh, I guarantee to everyone that I met that we're going to work together and, and get this right. Thank you, Mr. Microphone number three, please. Uh, thank you, Nigel. My name is Jack Heath. I'm the Deputy Mayor of Markham. But for the purpose of this question, I'm more importantly regional councillor in the region of York. Uh, both municipalities are leaders in waste diversion in Ontario and in Canada. And so my question is for Minister Phillips. He has a new uh, ministry title, Environment, Conservation and Parks. And I want to come. Uh, congratulate the government and yourself for, for that combination. My question is, uh, will you commit to transition the Blue Box program to full producer responsibility at an accelerated pace to take this unfair burden off property taxpayers? That's my Minister Phillips. For, for, um, and I know everybody in the room here is familiar with cabinet making, so I can't take any credit for the job title, that's, that's, but, um, but thank you, and I do think it's a, it's a good combination of responsibilities. Um, this is one of the files, it's on the top of the pile uh, on, uh, on my desk. Obviously, uh, there was um, plans being made, and, and I think a lot of it was held up by the, by the previous government. Municipal leaders have been exceptionally clear uh, over the last couple days about their preferences. You will appreciate that producers uh, are, are fairly clear as well. I was commenting to one of your colleagues that, uh, in one of the delegations. Um, I have a feeling that both sides went back to their corners. Whatever conversations had, had happened before, uh, suddenly everybody's um, a, we, a distance apart. Um, this, this diversion issue is, is critical, as all of you know, for a number of reasons. Um, when it comes to, uh, to the, what we're putting in landfills, if we want to correct for that, if we want to um, manage that waste better, then we need to be diverting more. Um, primarily, that's going to come down to uh, producers needing to look at how, uh, what they produce, how they produce it, and, and taking responsibility and accountability for the full life cycle. Uh, the exact timing on that, as, as many pointed out in the meeting, the 2023 deadline, or the, yeah, 2023 um, is awfully soon. Uh, so um, so it's, it's, um, we will we'll be addressing it in the near term, um, but we'll be addressing it in consultation with all of you. I know it's um, I know it's a, a question that a number of municipalities make clear. They're looking at making investments right now. Um, they'd like to know, you know, sooner than later uh, what our timing is, and, and we'll, commit to, uh, we'll commit to moving quickly to, to resolve it. But it is a, it is a conversation, and it's a conversation that uh, we'll have to take a leadership role in, but that AMO and others will be very involved in. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number two, please. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Silverton from Grey Highlands, which is God's country, and neighbors of the Honorable James Wilson. My question is, I've been waiting and hoping to hear something about the PSA um, and what, what this government's uh, thoughts on the PSA are, and can we fix it, because it needs fixing. Your question is to which minister? Wh whoever wants to speak to the PSA. Oh. <laughs> It may be that no one wishes to speak to us. Is there anyone? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. It's, it's, yeah. Okay, Minister the Police Tabola? Services Act, for those the, that are asking. That's what you, yeah, <laughs> just in case. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Minister Tabolo? Hi. Um, yes, what we're doing is we're undertaking a review in terms of. Uh, Good looking at the various uh, provisions and uh, what regulations will be developed under it, and we are consulting with all stakeholders. So that is a process that we've undertaken and will continue um, so that we do listen and provide proper uh, consultation and proper provisions to assist both the police and also the enforcement. Okay. Thank you very much. Microphone number one, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Sue Fox, and I'm the Mayor of North Dumfries, Regional Councillor for Waterloo Region. I also on the, sit on the Grand River Conservation Authority. My issue touches housing, health, education, police services, emergency services. And the minister who, to whom you'd like to address your question. Whichever one would like to answer first. The issue is that we have an increase of mentally ill on our streets. We have an increase in people seeking housing. 
and now we have an opioid crisis. 4,000 people in the last year have died of drug overdose. Last week, seven in one night. We don't have a solution yet. I don't think we do. I don't, myself, I don't believe safe injection sites is the correction. But we need a solution. And we need you all to put your brains together because time is running out for people every single day. And we need your help and we need your support. And I seriously hope you look at it seriously and hard because time is running out. By the way, North Dumfries may not be the most beautiful, but it okay. is wonderful. Okay. And the heart, people have hearts of gold. Okay. Okay. Question to the Minister of Health. Thank you. I, I think I'll take a first uh, start at this question because it is important to uh, municipalities all across the province. We know that we have a serious opioid issue. We have serious mental health and addictions issues. That is one of the reasons why we made a campaign promise during the election that we were prepared to spend $3.8 billion over 10 years to develop a comprehensive okay. mental health and addiction strategy. That's $1.9 billion from the provincial government to match the $1.9 billion coming from the federal government. And it's not any one ministry. It's not just in the Ministry of Health. It's in probably about 12 different ministries. My responsibility has, has the uh, role of five. pulling it all together, but almost every minister here this afternoon has a role to play. You're absolutely right. We need to make sure that people are, um, are safe. We need to make sure that we have a safe place to live. Part of our mental health and addiction strategy will include housing solutions, and we're looking for innovative solutions that will um, serve people in the way they need to, because we know there are thousands of people uh, that don't have spaces to live. And we also need to take a look, and you may know that I have been given the responsibility to take a look at supervised injection sites yeah. to understand whether the evidence is there that they should be continued or not. And that is what Mayor Ford, or sorry, Premier Ford, has asked me to do. And that is what I am embarking on right away. We are starting with that uh, analysis from people who think that they're the most wonderful things ever and we can't possibly not continue to fund them to other people that don't think that they have that kind of credibility in use. But I can assure you we are going to be listening to everyone who has a view on this because we know it is important in all of our communities and uh, we want to make a recommendation to the Premier that he's going to be able to use to make a decision on. Okay. Thank you. And I understand Minister Tabola would like to add to that. Given the progress we're making, I think it's a worthwhile addition. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I think uh, I concur with what uh, Minister Elliott said. And one of the things that we have been discussing as a cabinet as well is that a siloed approach doesn't work when you're dealing with issues. I see it from a policing and a correction standpoint. But corrections and policing are simply dealing with the issue sometimes when it's already too late. So one of the things that we are doing is looking at the mental health and the addiction issues systemically right from the educational system and working our way through with youth, community, um, housing, and looking at all the different aspects and facets and trying to provide an integrated approach so that we can reduce the cost of policing, reduce the cost of corrections, and try to build a system that's integrated and helping people perhaps even before it becomes a problem. So it's exactly what we're looking to do. And one of the things that I'm really happy uh, to hear, and I've stood up in the House very quickly when uh, Minister Elliott has spoken about using an integrated holistic approach, because it's going to take all of us to find a solution and address it even before it becomes a major problem that requires more policing and more, uh, more corrections. Thank you, Minister. Microphone number well, four, please. Good afternoon, uh, Brian Smith, Mayor of the town of Wasaga Beach, the longest freshwater beach in the world and the most beautiful sunsets in the world. Uh, before I start, uh, I can't tell you how proud we are in Wasaga Beach of the Honourable Jim Wilson on that stage today. Jim, you're a great man. Keep up the great work. Uh, you know, I had the unfortunate uh, mishap uh, in my family over the last uh, short period of time. I lost my 87-year-old mother. And through that time, I was able to see some of the best and some of the worst in our healthcare system. And I will tell you that when my mother first entered hospital, um, it was very discouraging to me and I was angry. I was angry with doctors, I was angry with nurses. But quickly, it became very apparent to me that they were doing the absolute best they could do under the poor and extreme conditions that they need to work under. I then was able to see as she went into hospice care, the best care that you could ever imagine. 
and, uh, and but was able to see while I was there and to learn that although the citizens from our area had donated and increased four new beds in our hospice, that those beds wouldn't be open because there was no funding for them. So my question to the Honourable Minister of Health is that we have a crisis in this province and the crisis is how we deal with palliative care and how we deal with our seniors. I will tell you I have learned in five weeks okay. that the worst place for a senior in our province is in the hospital. Okay. So what can you tell me you're prepared to do for our seniors moving forward? Okay not only in the end of their life, but through their care as a senior in hospital. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Minister? Thank well, thank you very much for your question. There are many um, avenues to consider there, but I'll start with one of the major campaign promises we made during the election, which was to um, end hallway medicine. A lot of that has to do with making sure that uh, seniors, when they no longer need to be in hospital, alternate level of care patients, have a, either a long-term care home to go to or can go home on their own, which is what most people want, of course. And fortunately, we are able to help more people with increasingly acute conditions stay in their own homes, which is better for them and better for our economy, too. But we also need to make sure that we can find those long-term care spaces that keep people in hospital for inordinate periods of time and open up them up to things like infections and other things. So we uh, have indicated that we are going to uh, create 15,000 more long-term care beds in the next five years and another 15,000 in the five years after that. We know that we need to do that across the province. There is a, a measurement that one uses to determine that, but I think it's safe to say that virtually everywhere in Ontario, we need more long-term care homes. Uh, but we also, to answer the latter part of your question, hospice care is also really important. And I know that there have been hospices that have been opened up in a number of communities, including in my own riding of Newmarket Aurora, and I've seen several others, that are really providing excellent quality care to people at a, the most difficult time in their lives and very difficult for their families too. And the, um, the, the really innovative approaches that they're using in hospices to provide that comfort both to the patient as well as to their families is something that I think we want to see replicated across the province. And I would like to see us be able to expand it. I understand there's some projects in the works right now that we would like to see continued. So I think that we need to continue to do that to provide more quality care for seniors. The other issue that I think I'll just close on is the, um, the wet lawfare examination that's going on right now. Um, I am waiting uh, when the, uh, the inquiry has been completed to hear from the uh, group about what recommendations are going to be made with respect to specific care in long-term care homes other than medication and so on, dispensing of medication. I think there will be some uh, recommendations that we will all need to pay attention to. So there's a lot of work that we need to do on a lot of fronts, but I thank you very much for raising the question. Okay. Thank you, Minister. You'll notice, those of you who are checking your watches or phones, that we are about five minutes, almost five minutes past our scheduled stop time. That's because we started about five minutes late. So our last question, We'll go to microphone number five, and that'll be our last question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd say the cliche, save the best to last, but I best not, because the people at the other microphones may not agree. Uh, Steve Butlin, Councillor of City of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, the question for Minister Rickford. I have a bit of pang of conscience asking this question. It may be perceived as unfair, but I think you know all about this. Uh, Huron Central Railway has said they will cease operations between Sudbury and Sioux, but also I put in probably 20 other mus smaller municipalities like Massey and Echo Bay and Espanola uh, and uh, Nairn Center, et cetera, et cetera. They have about four months of business left. They said they will cease operations without federal provincial help. And your question, the, please. And my question is, thank you for prompting. The Premier at the time wasn't Premier, but during the campaign said, I'm committed to ensuring that this railway will continue operation. To the Minister, will you confirm that promise? Mr. Well, thank, Rickford. Yeah, th thank you for that question. Uh, what, I, what I can confirm to you is that uh, rail, bus, 
transportation networks uh, in Northern Ontario have moved to the top of, of my priority. Obviously, you can appreciate out in Sault Ste. Marie that from Northwestern Ontario's perspective, uh, we have some outstanding uh, transportation network issues and challenges. Uh, I've taken uh, this particular matter uh, under consideration. I'm reading it in with uh, some rail opportunities uh, in the northeastern side of northern uh, Ontario, and we'll be in a position to comment on that uh, a little bit more substantially in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I had predicted we would have 20 questions. We actually went through 29. So congratulations to the ministers and all of those of you out there for keeping your questions short. So, Minister Clark. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to everybody who uh, participated in the Minister's Forum. I'm sure we all agree it was a nice, uh, lively and engaging debate. I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank Nigel for doing a, another great job as moderator. Let's give him a big round of applause. He's a real pro. <laughs> Nigel's another one that knew me when I had long hair. So, uh, My colleagues and I really appreciate uh, the feedback that we, you, we've received, not just here at the Bear Pit session, but also at uh, many meetings. Uh, I appreciate uh, in Lynn's, uh, President Lynn's speech that uh, uh, she said we set a record for uh, accepting uh, meetings with AMO delegates, so I'm very proud of that. I also want to take this opportunity, in addition to the ministers that are here, I also want to recognize our parliamentary assistants and members of our government team. So I'd like those members to either stand up or give a wave. I'd like you to give them a round of applause because they, uh, they had quite a few meetings today. So let's hear it for them. So ladies and gentlemen, I just again want to take this opportunity to express my uh, congratulations and kudos to AMO for organizing not just a, such a great uh, minister's forum, but also a great conference. This has been uh, a fantastic couple of days. Uh, uh, members of our government team look forward to engaging uh, with our municipal delegates. And I'd like to uh, close by just again thanking you and asking you to join us for the Ontario reception, which I'm affectionately calling the ministerial meet and greet. So please join us outside the, uh, the doors for that. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your evening. Merci beaucoup. No, I want your watch. That's my prize. My prize and is your watch. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you again tomorrow morning where our main stage sessions will be at the Westin Hotel. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, our main stage plenary session will be in the Westin Hotel tomorrow morning. Thank you.